right, let's get our Bibles, and we're going to get right into, into the world. Let's go to the book of Titus, chapter number 2. Thank you very much. Titus, chapter number 2. And we want to start reading verse 11. We're going to read that down to verse 15. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, through verse number 15. One of the greatest things you're going to have to learn in this ministry, my responsibility is to teach you how to live. Let me say it again. My responsibility, that's why I'm a pastor of a church, a pastor like a father of the church, and you have to teach the people how to live. Amen. Amen. It's not just getting saved. Getting saved is also connected to how to live. Because if you're saved, you're going to live right. And if you're not saved, or otherwise you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't live right. This is not a game. I'm, I'm, not, I'm your pastor. I'm not going to sit by and just let you die and go to hell and don't say, don't say nothing about it. Amen. All right, so Titus chapter, chapter number, I don't get a lot of amen when I talk about stuff like that, but, amen. you know, I, I, the, word, the word says, without holiness, amen. and that's what the word says, without holiness, no man going to see the Lord. Amen. This is not a game. Heaven is holy. It's a holy God. It's a holy place. Amen. Amen. And we are holy people. Amen. Let's go to Titus. And then after Titus, we're going to go to the first Peter, uh, uh, chapter 2. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it happen for you. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Amen. That's all I can do. When I tell you the truth, it's up to you. It's in your hand now. Amen. All right, now Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read it. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appealed to all men, teaching us that denying, you see the word denying? Denying ungodliness and what? And worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He's talking about right now. All right. Verse number 13, looking for that blessed hope in which at that time they were, Church folk now still looking for him, but that's okay. Look on. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from what? All sin, all iniquity. And then we're going we gonna to talk about the second part today. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. He not only, he not only redeemed us, he, his whole mission was to purify unto himself a peculiar people. I want to see that he do it. Somebody say he did it. Yes. Yeah, Pecu purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good work. These things speak and exhort <clears throat> and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You can take your seat. Now, let's go, to, let's go before we pray. As a matter of fact, we're going to pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the Holy Spirit. You lead us and you guide us. Help us to understand your word. First of all, I want to thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, we are none of yours. So we give you all the praise now and all the glory and all the honor. Now we bless you, we praise you, we appreciate you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his dying, his death, his burial, his resurrection in whom we have our faith in in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And all agree that prayer said amen. amen. All right, now, let's get into the Word because this is what it's all about. It's all, it's all about the Word. Amen? Amen. And I, I said it in all humility. I, I'm a pastor. I don't tell you nothing that I don't do. Amen. I don't tell you to give when I don't give. I don't tell you how to live. I don't live that life. And you can't say you can't live it because I'm sitting here with 52 years of marriage. So can't, you can't say it can't be done. It can happen. But the key, it, the key to all this stuff is be holy for I'm holy. Marriage is holy. Amen? All this stuff. I know we don't want to hear this today, do we? Well, let's move on because we're going to hear it anyway. 
we got some word for you today. Now, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to deal with the second part, but let's go to Hebrew, Hebrew 9, 14. I said I'm going to go to Peter. Well, let's do the first Peter 2, 9, because I said I was going to go there. First Peter 2, 9 and 10 together. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 together. This is what the word said about us. Now, we know Peter said it to the church at that time, but we the church, we are the body of Christ. Watch what he says. But you are a chosen generation. This is what God said about us. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Somebody say, I'm special. See, that's what that means. I'm a, we are peculiar people. But watch what he said, that we should bring forth the praise of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we have to be thankful to the Lord, all right? Now, let's go to Hebrews, where we're going to get our subject. Hebrews chapter number 9. So anytime I minister the word, don't think Pastor Crump picking on me. Pastor Crump just picking on me. Pastor Crump is not even looking at you. I have so many things going through my head right now, I don't have time. My job is to watch these three cameras and watch that clock up there. Praise God. That's why I put my wife up here. I don't have to be looking for her. Sitting right over. <laughs> Hebrew chapter 9. Let's start reading verse 11. This is where we're going to get our subject. Hebrew 9 11. But Christ, that's what we are, Hebrews 9 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. How many know what the holy place is? You, you, know ye not? That's why I talk about this morning. Know ye not? <laughs> Praise God. You don't know what the holy place is? All right. Having obtained, watch this, having obtained what? Eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean sanctify the pure and fine of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, somebody said the blood of Christ, Christ. yet yeah, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, that's going to be our subject. Say, God, God. purified God. our conscience. Say, God, God. purified God. our conscience. Right. He purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we, Christ purified our conscience so we can serve the living God. Christ cleansed our conscience so we can serve the living God. Now, when we talk about the word conscience, we're talking about our mind, talking about our soul, talking about our hearts. Christ, through his own blood, purified our conscience so we could serve the living God. So I, I believe he deserved the glory. He purified our conscience. We talk about eight reasons why God raised Jesus from the dead. We are showing you that what he did, Hebrews 9, 14, one more time. How much more shall the blood of Christ, this is what he did on the cross, through his own blood, offer himself without spot to God. He kept the law, the commandments, and everything else before the Father. And then he died on the cross, and he offered himself without spot to God. And then he purged our conscience from dead works. The dead works I'm giving to you, there's four of them. These are the dead works. Dead works, number one, this is what he cleansed our conscience of. Number one, guilt. He cleansed our conscience of four things, dead works. Number one, guilt. Number two, 
condemnation. He cleansed our conscience of condemnation. Number three, fear. We know it was there because when Adam ate of the tree of neither good and evil, he hid himself and he said, I was afraid. God cleansed our conscience from fear. And number four, unbelief. When you are born of the Spirit, those four things are not there anymore. The guilt is gone. The condemnation is gone. The fear is gone. And unbelief is gone. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Spirit to believe. You have the Spirit of faith. That's what God gives you. So you can't say, I don't believe when you're saved. You can't say, I can't do when I'm saved. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things. Not something. But it's always through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, what I want to do today, I want, I want to dive into this man. I've been wanting to preach this for a long time. Because this is one of the reasons when God raised Jesus from the dead, he purged our conscience. I'm using the word purified. The same word as purged our conscience, our soul, from dead works to serve the living God. So what I want to do, I want to just walk through those. Let, let's, go, let's go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Now, I always say to you, why don't I do this no more? You know, when people ask in a church, it says, well, I'm not going to that church because they don't, they don't baptize no more. Let's go there first, shall we? Let's go to Acts first. <clears throat> Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 26. Let's show you why pastor don't, don't baptize no more. See, if you go to a church, somebody say, well, I'm not coming over there. Your pastor don't even baptize with water no more. How, how many ever heard that from somebody? Sure you have. Some of y'all need to repent. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm sorry. But you know you heard that I'm not going to your church because y'all don't baptize no more. How many heard that I'm not going no more because y'all don't take communion no more? I mean, you hear it all the time. But the key is, you got to know why. Because you go here. Acts 26. Watch what, watch what God says to the Apostle Paul. He gave Paul his vision. Acts 26. He gave Paul his vision, and then he told Paul to be baptized and wash away thy sins. I think I got the right chapter on it. I'm not full enough on it. I may be in 22. I don't think I'm over for it now. Yeah, uh, yeah, Acts 22, I'm sorry, I'm at 26. Acts 22. Watch what he said to Paul. Let's start verse 11. Now he's talking to Paul, so what people do, they'll take this. Now remember, Paul was a Jew. They'll take this and they say, see there, that's what we got to do. Well, let's listen to it real good for a change, right? Because our message is, God purified our conscience. God purified my soul. God purged my soul. Now, we heard David say this in the Old Covenant, Psalm 51. Anybody remember that? Purge me with his. You heard it probably one or two times, right? Right. Now, in Acts 22 and verse 11, that's where we are. Watch what he says. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout, a devout man according to the law, Ananias was according to what? Ananias was under the law. This man under the law telling Paul something. So what we do, we take and say, well, you know, God talking to us. But I'm not under the law. Amen. I don't sit by that river. I don't get my water from that river. Let's move on. Watch what he said to him. And one Ananias, the devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto Paul and stood and said to Paul, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up on him. 
And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you, Paul, that you should know his will and that you shall see that just one and you shall hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And watch what Ananias, a man of the law, going to tell Paul. And now, Paul, and now, why tarrest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, call it on the name of the Lord. He told Paul to wash away your sins. Now, that was what Ananias said to Paul. What people do is, well, we need to be water baptized so we can wash away our sins. That is not what that says. Let's, let's give you just a few things before I get on my message of purification. Let's go to Revelation 1 and verse number 5. Let, now, I could just go to it, dive in anywhere. I can just, this kind of stuff, I can dive in. But let's go to Revelation 1 and 5. Don't want nobody to hurt themselves. They might not have swam before. So I don't want you to dive off the board and you get hurt here. Revelation 1 and 5. Let's see what Revelation 1 and 5. Watch what the Word says. See, you go to Acts where you never got into uh, the message of grace yet. That doesn't start to the book of Romans. The first book of, the, of your salvation is Romans, not Acts. All right, Romans chapter 1, verse 5 on the screen. Here's a letter from Jesus Christ, who was the faithful witness. He's the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. He said this, unto him that loved us and what? Let's read it. I need your help today now. And what? Washed uh, us from our sins. How did he do it? Now, if Jesus Christ washed us from our sins in his own blood, then we're supposed to do what now? Give him the praise. glory. Give him the praise and the glory. So when you, when, you, when you say water washed away your sins, you are not giving God the praise and the glory. You do know that, right? Let me say it another way. My, my wife is a, is, a, is a great cook. I'm not just saying this just to say, my wife, I'm not going to tell you the name of dishes because you'd be like, Sister Clump, I want you to fix me one of them things. But my wife is a great cook. All right? Now, I give her her credit. I don't just sit there and eat up the food and say, mmm, mmm, that's good. I said, no, honey, you can cook. I love you. You can really cook. And my wife can cook me. She cook me anything I want. That's what she said to me. What do you want to eat? That's how she talked to me. I said, well, I, I think I have some, uh, some of this. She said, okay, be ready in a minute. That's how she treats me, like, like a king. So that's why I treat her like a queen. Amen. Ain't that right? But I'm just saying, but I give her the glory. You give people the glory. So what I'm saying is, if God washed your sins away, stop saying water did it. Give him the praise and the glory. He did it. Amen. Somebody say amen. Now, now, I just showed it to you in Titus. Let's go back to Titus. That's the first thing I read, wasn't it? Titus 2.14. Let's go back there one more time. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's go to verse number 14. Just one verse. Who gave himself for us. Why did he do it, Pastor? That he may redeem us. What the word redeem mean? By, purchase us from our iniquity purifying unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good work. Then I gave you Hebrew 9.14. I'm just, I'm just backtracking just to see how you've been following me. Hebrew chapter 9 and verse number 14. So if you're going to give him the glory, I'm giving you a couple of verses here to show you where it is. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God purge your conscience. I'm talking about the same thing he washed your soul from dead works so you can serve the living God. He did it with his own blood. All right, now. Now, now the message. Let's go to the book of Acts. Chapter 10, verse 9. I got to do this because this is something that I did on the previous tape. So I want to do this because I want to show you the answer up front. Then we're going to look at these words. I'm going to really try to pack you with some information today. Acts chapter number 10. Now, I'm, I'm doing this because it's happened and God going to tell you himself what he did. 
Acts chapter 10. See, you know, people are what taught wrong. There are a lot of folk in churches don't really want to be there, because, but they don't know nowhere else to go. They can't come to, they can't come to the door of faith because we don't baptize. That's what people say. We, I can't go over there because they don't baptize no more. I like to go to the door of faith, but they don't, they don't uh, do communion no more. They don't foot wash. See, if you, you, if you want foot wash, water baptism, communion, you don't need to come here because we don't do that. Now, we will teach you the word. And we will show you why we don't do that no more. Man, they don't even believe Jesus coming again. You just don't know that church messed up over there. I'm not saying I don't believe Jesus coming. I just believe he already came. And I don't believe you or the people waiting for him. As a matter of fact, you miss your ride on the just a natural, natural people. And you waiting for God. I, I know you're in problem. Because he's going to come as a thief in the night. And guess what you're going to be doing? I would do it, but I, won't, I don't want to teach you no bad habits. I saw Pastor Crump doing this here. Because they shimmy, they shimmy now. Yeah, they just put it out there and just... Oh, yeah. Just go on do your thing, hon. Just make sure you don't, the Lord don't catch you while you're out there shimming. All right. All right. Let's move on. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, and they drew nigh to the city. I'm going to talk to this camera a while. Watch what happened. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. It was about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open. He saw a vision. A certain vessel was descending unto him, and it had been a great seat knit to the four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now these things Israel were taught not to eat. And then in verse number 13, there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. He said, Common, unclean. And the voice spake to him again the second time, What God has cleansed. What did he say? What God has cleansed, that call not thou come. Say that, what God has cleansed. Don't call that common. Now watch and let's see what God has cleansed. So we, I'm teaching you eight things happened when God raised Jesus from the dead. He purified your soul. He cleansed your soul. Call not that common. This was done three times, and the vessel will receive up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself, which he had seen should be, behold, the man. This is what it says. Why Peter doubted himself what this vision should mean? The men, which were sent from Cornelius, had made inquiry or Simon house and stood before the gate. So those things that those animals represent Gentiles. Everybody understand that? And he called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was there. Why Peter thought on the vision? The Spirit of the Lord said, Behold, three men seek you. What well, Peter just saw, four-footed beasts. He saw wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of there. And at his gate were Gentiles. Can anybody see it yet? So it wasn't about the snakes and the unclean thing. It was Gentiles because that's who Peter had a problem with. Now the Bible says, Arise, therefore, get thee down, go with them, doubt nothing, for I have sent them. What God had cleansed. Go to chapter 11, verse 9. So when Peter gave his testimony, chapter 11, verse 9. Acts chapter 11, verse 9. Peter giving his testimony now. Watch what his testimony is going to say. In verse 8, back at one verse. Peter giving his testimony. He said, God told me to rise up and eat. But I said in verse 8, not so, Lord. Nothing common or unclean has any time in my mouth. See, remember, he's on the housetop waiting on, it, waiting on to eat. And verse 9, 
And the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed. Do you see it? Say it. What God has cleansed, that called no man, not man coming. So otherwise, if God has cleansed it, don't call it coming. Well, what did God cleanse? He cleansed the Gentiles. He cleansed all men. I just read it to you. Let's go back and see it again. Revelation 1 and 5, because you, 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 you missed it. Now, if God wash your soul, then when you think your soul will be clean, Revelation 1 and 5. So you got to understand, God cleansed your soul on the cross. He did it through one man, Jesus, because Jesus was a soul man. See, your job is just believe. Hear and believe. Hear and believe. When you start trying to figure it out, that's where you flunk math at. Revelation 1 and 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and, say it loud, and washed us from what? He washed us from our sins. How did he do it? I said, how did he do it? He did it in his own blood. Say it. He did it in his own blood. All right, now. Let's go to John chapter 12. Headed to my message. John chapter 12. John chapter number 12. Let's go down in verse number, let's do 27. Let's back up a little. John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, Jesus says. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? How many know he's talking about he getting ready to go to the cross? But for this cause came out to this hour. No. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now when God raised Jesus from the dead, he glorified him. You understand that? And then verse number 29. Then the people that stood by said and heard it, said it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus said unto them, this voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. What's, what else are you going to say? Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You know, people still don't think the devil has been cast out. People still think the devil is well. And, I mean, in the Bible told you, he walked about as a roaring lion. Seeking whom he made a vow, whom resist steadfast in the faith. That's what Peter said. Jesus said he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Here he said he cast him out. All right. And then he says something else. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What are you saying? What are you, what's he saying? And I, if I be lifted up on the cross... I'll draw all men into me. Where are you right now? In Christ. How do you get there? That's what he's talking about. On the cross, he brought all men into you. See, you got to see the, the Noah's ark. How was the people in the days of Noah? That's why Jesus gave a parable. As in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. Well, what happened in the days of Noah? All people came into the ark. Let's move on. You're not ready for that one. I told you this morning, uh, the word conscience, once again, is the soul, the heart, the mind. Purge, let me give you the definition for purify, because he purified our conscience from dead works. It means to purge. It means to cleanse. I just gave you one verse on cleanse. It is to purify our conscience. And I told you the, de the dead works were four things. Guilt, condemnation, fear, and unbelief. So God, cleanse your conscience from that. That's why the, the word said, God has not given us the spirit of fear. How many know that without the spirit? I can't hear nothing y'all saying. You I, 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 I can hear that. That's all I can hear. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. Thank you very much. 
put it on the screen, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. God, God, I know you're at that mass. He got that mass, so I can't. That, that, that. So. All right, here we go. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. So he reminds you that new man does not have the spirit of fear. New man has power, love, and a sound mind. That's the new man. See, God put you in the new man, that's Christ. Somebody say amen. All right, now, now let's go to work, because I want to I wanna get into this. Now, I gave you 2 Peter, but I want to I wanna go back and read 1 through 9. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 9. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 9. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and through sanctification of the Spirit, and unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ Jesus, grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch what he's going to get to here. I'm coming to this camera again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a lively hope. How did he do it? By the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. Can't you see it? He begotten us to a lively hope. Also to an inheritance. Verse number four. To an inheritance. Incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. Watch what he says, reserved in heaven for you. Peter said reserved in heaven. How many know what we was reserved at? You got to know what heaven is. See, you got to understand, heaven is, heaven is a person. Say it with me, heaven, heaven is a person. Right, that's why you got to understand you need to be in heaven. Now, if you're in heaven, where are you? Now, this is what my Bible said. My Bible told me that you are in heavenly places right now. See, you got to understand, you've been taught wrong. Like I said, we got to come to a conclusion that all the old stuff we've been taught has been just taught wrong. They haven't taught us about Christ. You are in Christ. Say, I'm in Christ. I'm in, I'm in heaven. I'm in See, a lot of people don't oh, man, you teach the people they're already in heaven? They supposed to be going to heaven. Well, if you ain't saved, Now, this is what you usually tell people when they ain't saved. You don't tell them to go to heaven. You tell them to go there. <laughs> See, you're not catching on what you're saying. You don't tell them to go to heaven. You do it all the time. A man not saved, you tell him to go to. When you should sure be telling them to go to. you catch on. You'll catch on in a minute. Some of y'all take a little while, a little time. What did he say? What are you talking about? Don't tell them to go there. Okay. All right. Watch what he said. It reserved in heaven for you. If it reserved in heaven for you, then where all is your inheritance? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 told you all the promises of God in that, see, if you, if you look at the word, that's where it is. It's in Christ. But Peter used the word heaven. Not, Paul has a revelation. That's why you got to understand about Paul. All right. Now, here at verse number five. Who, now, he talked about it's in heaven. Paul talked about it's in Christ. Do everybody understand the difference? All right. Said so Paul talks about in Christ. Peter talked about in heaven. So you got to understand the difference because Paul has the revelation of heaven, right? Okay. Verse number five. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, on the salvation, ready to be what? Well, that's what Paul does. This stuff is revealed. So Peter said, it's ready to be revealed. Then he says, in the last time. Now, I can, I can take you to 1 John. Now, in, in 1 John, we'll say, this is the last time. But see, I don't have time to go through all that to prove anything to you. All right? Wherein you greatly rejoice that now for a season, if need be, you were in heaven is through manifold temptations. So he's talking to Israel or the first church or the church of the first century. 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance, see, they were still waiting on Christ, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Who have not seen you love, in whom now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here it is. Receiving the end of your faith, and he called the end of your faith the salvation of your soul. So when God gave them their faith, that was their salvation. That's why they had to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 10 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come. Remember, it came to us. We are in the grace. I'm going to teach grace here forever, so you might well realize you're in grace. Grace ain't coming. Grace already here. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Here he says, searching what and what manner the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, said the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of Christ. said the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. is the Spirit of Christ. Right, so some places will tell you, no, you're not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and God is in you. If God is in you, Christ is in you. Here he said the Spirit of Christ is in you. So the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. All right, same person, all right? Such in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it's testified before the suffering of Christ and then the glory that shall follow. Under whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they that minister the thing which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel to you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which thing the angel desire to look into. In the last verse, Peter said to them, Now gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so they got the grace when the Lord Jesus Christ was revealed to them. Go to Galatians 4. Let's see when you got it. I'm going to show you two places. I'm going to show you Galatians 4 and I'm going to show you Ephesians 3. When did you get the grace? See, the key is we have the grace, we just don't know we got it. Because we hear Pastor Crump this week, and then we, who tell you you have it, and then you hear somebody else tell you we got to get it. Then this other church over here still praying till the glory come down. So you don't know what you got. Gal Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, say that's me. that's me. All right, we know when we see Christ, we know that's me. As long as he's a child, he differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. That's how it was with Christ. But he's under tutors and governors under the time appointed of the Father. This is what happened to Jesus. Until the time appointed of the Father. Verse 3, even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Talk about the law. That's what they were. But when the fullness of time was coming, no, the fullness of time was come. Well, what is the fullness of time? It's the message, it's the dispensation of grace. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. When Jesus preached, what did he preach? Glad you asked, Pastor, all these questions, because I know the people know. Let's go to Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah 6 to 1. When Jesus preached, what did he preach? Why did everybody come out and follow Jesus during his ministry? He had to be preaching something the prophet wasn't preaching. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 6 to 1. Start with verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach what? Good tidings. Who he preaching to now? He preaching to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the open of the prison to them that are bruised. What do they get bruised at? Under the other folks' religion. 
here it is, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. How many know what is the acceptable year of the Lord? Let's go to Ephesians 1, let's see. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Ephesians chapter 1. Lord, what is your acceptable year? What year did you accept us? Ephesians chapter 1. And verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly place in Christ. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him. How many know he chose you in him? Not many of y'all know. I just hope, I just thank God I'm not God. Because if he asked that, you'd be like, say, okay. According as he has chosen us in him, when did he choose you in him? Before the foundation of the world. When did God choose you in Christ? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, without blame before him in love, having predestinated us, to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to his own good pleasure, or the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has, that the word is, made us. Oh, Jesus. Let me go back to my camera. He has made us what? Accepted in the beloved. When did God accept you? In the beloved. But when did he accept you? 2,000 years ago at the cross when God put you in Christ, he accepted you. See, we know no man. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. See, God has accepted you. In the old covenant, you was not accepted. There's no one in the world you can go to church like you're doing right now. Because only the Jews had the temple. And we were not allowed. But God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Let's go there. Start verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. There we go. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live. Now you live. You got life. Now what are you supposed to do? They which live now should not henceforth live unto themselves. You, now you're supposed to live unto him which died for them and rose again. So you got to ask yourself, am I living for him or am I living for me? You got to ask yourself that question. Because if you're living for him, you're doing it his way. You're living for you. You're doing it your way. Verse number 16. Wherefore, henceforth from now on, know we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet know we him no more. Why? Because we are in the dispensation of grace. In the dispensation of grace, it's no more flesh. What did he say? No more flesh. That if any man be in Christ, he's no more flesh. He's a new creature. He's spirit. He's no more flesh. He's no more Jew, no more Gentile, no more bond, no more free. You're all one in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All right, let's move on because I got, I got to get somewhere. Go to Hebrew chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrew chapter 1. Verse 1. Oh, God, I got to get here. Hebrew chapter 1 and verse 1. When you can appreciate Christ and where he is, God can show you where you are. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, at sundry times and divers manners, spake in time past. Now remember, Paul is quoting this 2,000 years ago. Paul is reading this. He says, God, if you look at Hebrews, it'll say A.D. 64. So you know it wasn't the 2020, 2021, was it? Right. A.D. 64. We're talking about 34 years after the resurrection of Jesus. After Jesus fulfilled Acts and then he went up to heaven, Jesus died in A.D. 30. Here it is, A.D. 64. And Paul says, God, who has sunk the time and died with man of spake in time past, unto the Father, he's talking about under the law, by the prophets, that's how God spoke to Israel, hath, past tense, in these last days, he called the last days, 2,000 years ago, the last days. Now, you know people would ask, tell you today, because you know we living in the last days. And what I say is the last days of what? And they can't say nothing, because you don't have no last days in grace. Grace is the spirit. Grace is eternity. Do you know when you left the cross, you are in eternity? Now you have eternal life, or you're going to have eternal death. That's what you got to understand. You're not, you're not before the cross. You're after the cross. God has already died on the cross. He's already made sure you have life, so, but you got to find eternal life. He gave you life at the cross. I came that they might have life, but it didn't stop there, and that you might have it more abundant. That's eternal life. See, what happened is, as soon as we go to church, we feel like I came to the altar, so I'm okay. I must be all right. And then I go out and live my life. No. If you're still living your life, you don't have his life. You can't have his life and live your life. Let's move on. Hath passes in these last days spoken to us by his son. Well, you know he spoke to us by his son 2,000 years ago. Matter of fact, not even us, the people before us 2,000 years ago. Whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom we, he made the world. Who being the brightness of his glory, that's who Christ is. Christ is the brightness of his glory. Christ is the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself, here's it again, purged our sins. What did he do? He purged. What did it mean to purge? To cleanse, to wash away. He purged, washed away our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, if he already purged our sin, why do I need to want to baptize you? Because what did he tell Paul when you want to baptize in Acts 22? He says, and wash, wash away thy sins. That was before the cross. That was to Jews before the cross. So that's why he was still talking about, that's John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist told them. You can't wash away no sin now, man. I'd be glad when I get in the church where people don't think you can wash your sins away. How you gonna wash them away? It took God to come here with his own son and wash your sins away. With his own blood. Man, if you believe that, you're going to hell, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> and I can't do nothing for you. Don't call me, I don't have nothing for you. <laughs> I told you all I can tell you. Knucklehead, that's all I would call you. You had to do it your way. I did it my way. Okay. Hebrew 922, because you're going to hell just as sure as you're born. I'm telling you, you got to believe this word, and Christ died for your sins. That is the first thing you must believe is Christ died for my sins and then he was buried and then God raised him from the dead for me. He did it all just for me. And that's where my faith is. And when you go here with this other stuff, you're going to hell. I might well tell you. I'm a pastor 36 years. You see a sound back 36 years? I've been in ministry for 40. And I'm not doing all this here, man. I'm not going through all this here for you to live a life and die to go to hell. That's, not my, that's why I talk about it so much. If you go to hell, it's not going to be my fault. I'm telling you right now. Let the devil go to hell by himself. That's what I would say. That's, that's his place. The Bible says he went to his own place. See, heaven is God's place. Hell is the devil's place. Why you want to go to hell with the devil anyway? 
strange. Hebrew 9, 22. Hebrew 9, 22. Almost all things about the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. You can't wash nobody off with water and get no sin forgiven. The word remission means forgiven. Without the shedding of blood, if Christ had not shed his blood, there would be no forgiveness. See, we, you want to find something to get excited about? This is what I get excited about. When I realize he watched my sin. Go to Hebrew 10 and 2. 10, 1 and 2, you right there. Hebrew chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. This is what, this excites me. I went to bed last night at 6 o'clock. I'm telling you, I want to get to bed and woke me up with all this pam, 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 pam stuff. I got up, I got up at 11 o'clock, ate some hot tamales. I'm a country boy. Eat hot tamales and go right back to bed. You ain't country, don't try that. My wife will tell you, this I'm all right. Got 11 something, ate me some hot tamales, went back to bed. He said, what you doing up? They woke me up all this, pow, 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 pow. Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never. The law. See, that's what bread on the table is. That's the law. Water baptism is the law. Foot washing. That's the law. Can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually can never make the comma thereof perfect. Let's see what that means. For then would they have not ceased to be offered if they were working, because that the worshippers once purged, that's that man at water baptism pool, he was purged, he should have no more conscience of sin. If that law was working, when they drop you down in that baptism pool and raise you up, if that was the way God going to cleanse you, you should not have no more conscience of sin. Now you ask anybody who got water baptized, do you have any more conscience of sin? And they're going to say, yeah. Because water cannot wash your soul clean. It took the blood of the almighty lamb. Man, that, that just, it just, oh my God. I don't, I don't know. The blood, the blood of Christ washed all men's sin away. One day on the cross. One time, it just, it just, it just, <clears throat> don't mess with me right, you don't want to mess with me right now anyway. Hebrew 9, 8 and 9, let's back up to Hebrew 9, 8 and 9. See, it took the blood to wash the conscience away. Hebrew, Hebrew 9 and verse 8. The Holy Ghost, this signified that the way into the holiness of all were not yet made manifest. While the first tabernacle, was still standing. See, why Paul preached in Hebrew in AD 64, the first tabernacle was still standing. That's what he's telling you. So the, the Holy Ghost was signified that the way into the holiness of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle, it had to be destroyed. That's why you, you can Google that, not, not in here now, I know you're on your phone, you're watching Facebook, but listen, when you get some time, just Google the temple of Jerusalem. When was it destroyed? It's going to tell you A.D. 70. It's not hard. Jesus told you that 40 years later. When did Jesus die? A.D. 30. When was the temple destroyed? Count 40 years. A.D. 70. Don't take no rocket scientist to get all did 40 years. He just said, this generation... How long the generation, Pastor? 40 years. Don't take no rocket scientist, just take a believer. All right. He says, it was, not, it was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It had to be destroyed. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered. This is what happened in the first tabernacle. They offered gifts, they offered sacrifices, could not make him that did the service perfect. He's talking about righteous. Couldn't make him righteous. As pertaining to the conscience. 
See, he could not take the guilt and the condemnation and the fear and unbelief out of his conscience. And they did it ever since they came out of Egypt. And he's telling you, it didn't work. Now, hey, you want to go baptize a man in Pontiac and won't make it work. Which stood only in meat. He said, this is what, this is what all this is about. Meats, drinks, divers washings, water baptism, carnal ordinances, bread on the table, imposed on them until the time of reformation. And I'm going to show you the time of reformation has already happened. That is the dispensation of grace. Let's move on. Because I want to show you this. Let's go to, let's go to Genesis 1970. Genesis 19:17. I'm going to take about three minutes. So you want to add three minutes to my clock. Thank you. Genesis 19:17. It came to pass when they had brought them forth, talking about Lot, out of Sodom. He said, read it with me real loud. Escape for thy life. I can't hear nobody with me. Anybody else here beside me? Oh, they're still trying to find. Oh, look up on the screen. What did he say? Escape for thy life. I told you what to say now. You do just say it. You don't have to look up on the screen. Some of y'all got to clean your glasses out and stuff. That's okay. I'll do it for you. Somebody say, escape for your life. life. They had come out of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, escape for your life. Number two, don't look behind you. Now, this is very important. Neither neither stay in the plain. Escape to the mountain. Lest you be consumed. Go to Luke 17, 24. We're done. I'm going to show you the exact same thing that Jesus talked about in Luke 17, 24 that he just talked about there. He was talking about when was Jesus coming again. Here it is. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one end of heaven unto the other, shineth, I'm waiting on the screen. When the lightning, there you go, that lightning out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part of heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in his day, or the coming of the Son of Man. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Now we're talking about 40 years ago. 2,000 years ago, this book of Luke was written before A.D. 40. Now, Jesus was born in A.D. 30. Jesus Jesus died A.D. 30. So we talking about a man wrote his book before A.D. 40. Now, here it is, 2,000 years ago, Jesus says, First, he must suffer the many things and be rejected of this generation. So we know he's not talking about us, is my point. Here we go. And it, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. As in the days of Noah. Well, how was it in the days of Noah? He's going to tell you. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. They enter into the ark. Well, remember, he's the ark. Right? So, in the days of Noah, everybody wanted to be saved. They entered into the ark. And then the flood came. Now, the flood was a tribulation. The flood came and then destroyed them all. So, he was letting them know, you better try to make sure you and me. Because the flood's going to come and going to destroy you. Tribulation's going to come after this. And then it said, likewise, also as in the days of Lot. Noah and Lot, only two references he gave. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So he's letting them know two things. 
It's going to be like the days of Noah, the days of Lot. Here it is. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which be upon the housetop. I'm going to see where you catch it. His stuff is in the house. Let him not come down to take it away. He that's in the field, let him likewise not return. Then he said this, remember Lot's wife. Somebody say, remember Lot's wife. <laughs> what is about Lot's wife? When I first read Genesis, what did the man tell them to do? He said, escape for your life and don't look back. You go into the mountain. The word mountain means the kingdom. You know what she did? See, this is, this is what happened to Israel. Israel came out of Egypt. And they had a place that God sent them to was the promised land. And God told them, like in the days of Paul, it was fulfilled. God had given them grace. That's why you have the book of Galatians. And God told them, don't go back. You read the book of Galatia, what happened to them? God had brought them into the grace of God. Paul left and came back. They was back over at Peter Church. They was back at Peter Church, eating the bread off the table, baptizing, bringing their offering, which was meat and stuff they was bringing for the temple. They were doing temple worship again when Paul came back. And Paul came back, he was hot. Paul said to them, who... Let's look at it. Galatians 3, 1. This is all. We're done. You think Paul came back and says, you who's? Huh? No. Paul was mad because all the work he'd done with those people, he put them in grace. And that's what my job was to do is to lead you into the grace of God. So when somebody tell you, well, I can't go to that church because Pastor Crump don't baptize no more, you ought to say, hey, stop speaking evil of things you know nothing about. I'm waiting on Galatians 3.1. I'm closing out. Oh, foolish Galatians. Paul brought them into the grace of God. He said, we don't baptize it over here. That's 1 Corinthians 1.17. God sent me not to baptize he said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Somebody cast an evil spell on you. You've been following the wrong folk. You've been listening to the wrong folk. Who has bewitched you? Who has messed with your head? That you should not obey the truth. Before whom I, Jesus Christ, has ever been set forth, crucified among you. See, that's what he was, he was angry See, you don't know what's going on. What I've been doing is for 40 years. I stood here one Sunday with my arms up on this table that used to sit here, and God's my witness. When God spoke to me at that moment, I heard him loud and clear. And I knew if I do it, in, do it anymore, I'm out of here. And I'm not just talking about going home for the summer. I told my wife, I can't do it no more. I thought I was going to die right here. And I, some of you, you, you was here, you probably seen me. I was laid over on, I, I laid over on the thing, and I held myself up. And I said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He said, don't do this no more. And my wife would tell you I had to go and study. And when God showed me that, he said, look, I am the bread from heaven. I am the living bread. This is the Passover 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 8 says, Christ is the Passover now. You don't eat Passover off the table. He's a person. And that person's in here, and he gets offended. And the Bible said, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed to the day of redemption. So when you go do something that's not supposed to be doing no more, it grieves the Spirit. And I am not. Go to grieve the Holy Ghost so you can have some bread. My time is up. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. Your salvation is based on Christ's death, 
burial and resurrection. Not on whether you eat bread, not whether you got baptized in water, not whether you wash your feet. That is not going to help you. You must believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. He becomes your Lord in Christ. He comes and he lives on the inside of you, and now he becomes your Lord. He tells you what to do. He rules and reigns in your heart. Hey, my time is already gone. I thank you for yours, and the door of faith is open unto you.